everybody for coming to this uh, presentation. It has been a long time. I presented it in 2018, 2019, and then I went to sleep during COVID. And uh, this is, I'm just kind of waking up now. Uh, so we are going to be talking about the Drupal Q system. Um, this is me. Um, I've been working with Drupal since Drupal 4.6. So I've been using this platform for a very long time. Um, I'm very passionate about it. Uh, my company is SciShield. We are the gold standard in laboratory safety compliance. Uh, we have an unwavering commitment to mitigating risk in science from researchers at colleges, universities, to global pharma companies. Um, our platform is uh, hosted software as a service built entirely on Drupal and uh, Vue.js front end. Enough about me. I need to know how many of you guys are developers? Are you most of you? Okay. Um, have you ever worked, built queues before? Worked with the queue system at all? Okay. All right, great. Then you're in the right place because we're going to talk about the queue API. We have an agenda. We're going to talk about what the queue API actually is, when you should be using it, the types of database queues that are in Drupal, queue workers, and we're going to talk about specifically the types of queue workers that are uh, supported natively by Drupal. We'll talk about how to build your own scalable dynamic queue workers. And we're going to talk about uh, automated testing of, of these things because we're all writing automated tests, right? Uh, <laughs> okay. All right. What is a queue? A queue simply is a list of tasks to be completed. Th that's it. It's, it's, it's a tool for breaking up large operations into chunks that you can process in the background outside of your main thread. Um, and we will talk about what that means. What is the queue API? The queue API is, is some classes that are supported by interfaces, right? So we've got a couple main interfaces. We have the, the base queue interface class, and then you've got two types of that. You've got the reliable queue interface and the delayable. The reliable queue interface simply just extends the queue interface and doesn't provide any fancy methods or anything like that. But the delayable one allows queued items to be released on a delay, um, and it gives one extra method called delay item. Uh, both the, the, the Drupal core um, queue, database queue, actually implements both of those interfaces. Um, and then you've got the queue worker interface. And your queue workers are always going to implement the queue worker interface. And we'll talk about that in a minute, what that all means. Uh, so this is actually the queue interface. And this, so any, any class that implements this, this interface has to follow this interface and provide these methods. So what are these methods? Create them. Create item. That's for putting an arbitrary set of data into the queue. That's pretty simple. Number of items, very simple. Tells you what is, how many items are in your queue to be processed. Claim item is, is what your queue workers do to actually do work. And it's got this, this lease time with some pretty uh, interesting uh, connotations. So the default lease time is one hour. Um, and you can kind of, if you're doing your own um, queue worker, you can kind of muck around with this lease time depending on the type of work you're doing. If you're working on a, a very, very busy system with a large number of consumers and items, you, you might just kind of, you know, get better, uh, better effects out of, out of um, shorter lease times or, or larger ones. For the most part, you just leave that alone. Um, the default queue type for the database queue, it, it's a FIFO queue, so first in, first out. It's also called a simple queue or a linear queue. So an item comes in, goes out. Um, you can run these things via cron automatically with time limits, um, and we'll talk about what that looks like. You can also run queues individually using Drush, the Drupal shell. Um, I, in technical speak, you know, you talk about the end of the queue is called the rear. And then the top of the queue is called the front. So you might see those words uh, instead. Um, and then the, there are two types of queues that Drupal supply, uh, supplies. So there's the reliable queue. So you've got the database, and it, it does a pretty good job of, of making sure that the order of messages is guaranteed and that each item is going to be processed when your queue workers are running. 
Uh, Non-reliable, those are your memory cues, those are your batch cues. So when you do like, I don't know if any of you use like a search API or anything like that, and you go to, to index all of your stuff, that's a memory cue. Um, so you would use like a non-reliable queue when it, it is acceptable to have some misses at some data loss. So if you're processing like millions and millions and millions of things, like say a statistics module or you're logging stats just to some other thing, and you miss a couple of, of items, and it's not gonna affect your overall statistics, that would be an appropriate use of this because you need like a really high write throughput. You really need some, some severe performance. That's a great example of when to use it. Uh, I typically just use reliable queues for most of the stuff that I do. Um, and then database queue. So there's priority queue where you can actually set pr the priority of the items so that they can, instead of being first in first out, it's actually it's actually sorted by a priority. So you know, a typical Drupal, you know, you set like a negative ten, that's going to get processed before something with a twenty priority. Um, unique queues are great. So if you're processing like a lot of entities, but you only want those entities to be processed once. A uh, unique queue will, will make it so that uh, you can only put one entry in there that's unique, has a unique identifier. And then parallel queues is, is a project that I've been working on with uh, one of my coworkers, uh, Peter Wollinen, and uh, we will talk about that actually uh, at the end here. And what that allows you to do is run the queue workers in parallel so you can scale horizontally. All right, so when are we going to use queues? So, You've got a website, and you've got a bunch of stuff that you have to update all at once, right? So what do you do? You write a, a, a hook update end, right? And then you just loop through that, and, you, and it just starts running and running and running and running and running. And you, maybe you're doing it during a deployment window, and, and now you've got to wait for this thing to finish. And then it fails, right? You, it's a fatal error or a memory error or a database went away or a timeout or something, and then you've got to rerun it and try to catch up, right? We've all done that kind of stuff. Um, another example is you write um, a custom script that you run with Drush PHP script or something like that, and you again, same problem. You don't unless you're putting in lots of output, like I've processed you know item X out of Y. You don't know where you are in your processing. You don't know how many are left. Um, you have to write in all of your error handling. You have to write in all of your logging, so on and so forth. Um, another way is you. You know, a lot of people will write a form, right? And you submit the form, it creates a batch process, and then you just sit and wait. Again, you run into the same problems over and over and over again. Um, this is when you would use a queue, right? Because what the queue process does, it, it puts in the ability to retry things or, or suspend things or do all sorts of other things. And it all happens in the background, and you can scale it. Um, another reason you would use queues is let's say you've got um, let's say you've got a, a decoupled front end right and so they make it they make a request and it creates something some entity in the back end but that entity needs to then create some other entities or update some other things in the system or maybe go out to an, to an external API or something like that and you don't want that request to hang while all that work is being done you want better feedback to your to your users. You don't want to tie up that thread. Use a queue. Um, so we have examples of that in our in our platform where data gets posted, and then we have to go do something with all that data in the background, and we don't want the user to have to wait, um, and we don't want those threads to block either. Okay. So these these things that we've talked about, they're not scalable. They're not fault tolerant unless you put in a lot of code. Um, some people are like, well, you could just use, you know, PHP's process control and, and forks and stuff, but um, that is extremely dangerous um, in web production environments. It, it was never meant for, for that kind of usage. Um, it's extremely easy to fork bomb your server if you are not absolutely meticulous about handling the child processes. So not, not, a, good, not a good solution. All right. So let's talk about what queue workers are. They're plugins. Are we all familiar with plugins and how plugins work? Okay. So I don't need to go over that. All queue workers implement the queue worker in interface. What is that interface? It is super simple. It's got one method, process item, where dollar sign data is your arbitrary whatever data you pass into the queue. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna say 
do not pass in full entities into your into your queue. Do not queue up a full entity because then you run into problems with serialize and all this other stuff and it, and it breaks. Instead, put in your entity ID and then load it in your queue worker. Um, queue workers have one job and one job only, and that is to process a queue item and handle failures. Speaking of failures, you can throw any one of these exceptions and they have different meanings. So a requeue exception means that the processing was not able to be finished in, the, in this particular queue worker. It gets tossed back into the queue so another worker could, could pick it up. Right? So an example of that is you, know, you run out of time within your queue processes. This particular thing doesn't get finished. It'll requeue. Um, you can throw a generic exception. Uh, when you encounter a problem. Again, the API will automatically go and log that exception and requeue the item to be processed later. But then there's also the, the suspend queue exception. So examples of that, let's say that your queue workers are communicating with a, uh, an external API, right? First call goes out, you're fine. Second one goes out, you're fine. Third one fails. Fourth one fails. Fifth one fails. Okay, now you know that the external API is, is done go ahead and suspend the queue at that point. It'll stop you from burning cycles, it'll stop these things from processing, you can pick it up later. So by default, a queue worker instance processes one item at a time, right? Now, if you've been paying attention to what I've been saying, I, your question is, but that doesn't scale. That's no different than the other solutions, right? But they do scale. So there's a couple of different ways that you can do this. You can, instead of queuing up, um, let's say, one entity ID, you can put in a batch of, say, 50 IDs. You'll know, just build out an array of 50 IDs that you want your one queue worker to work on. And that one queue worker, in its allowed time, can work on all 50. Right? So that's, that's one way to do that. You can also use uh, multiple Linux cron tests to run your cron jobs. Um, so remember, I told you that um, you can run a queue manually using Drush. So that means that you can do multiple, cron uh, multiple uh, Linux cron jobs to process that same queue. Um, you could use systemd or supervisord to keep these workers always running, right? Um, so that, I, I, has anybody ever played with either one of those, supervisor or, or systemd? So basically, you know, it's, it's like a, an any file or whatever that sets up a process and it will automatically restart that that process if it dies. So a lot of times what you'll see is people will, will process maybe four or five items in that job, uh, you, know, you know, set out a set out a signal to kill it, and then system D will automatically restart it. So it's like a, it's almost like a demon at that point. Um, and then we'll talk about parallel queues again at the end. I know we're going really fast, but I've got code to show and I, I want you guys to kind of see how this stuff works. Um, so any queue implementation, this is what it looks like. You've got a queue worker, and you've got code to populate the queue. What does your queue worker look like? It looks like this. So we start at the top. Obviously, it, you know, with your namespace, it goes in your plugin directory, because I told you queue workers are plugins. Um, and you start off with this annotation at the very top at queue worker. So that tells the underlying system that this plugin is a queue worker type. It's got an ID. That ID is the name of your queue. So when you write your code to put items in the queue, that's the name that you use. It's got a title, so it shows up pretty in the, in the, the user interface, whether you're talking about Drush or you're talking about the, the Drupal UI. And then this cron bit is actually not required. So you can either, uh, if you put in this cron thing, every time that cron, the Drupal cron runs, it will process your queues automatically for you up to that amount of time. So maybe that's 60 seconds, maybe it's 180 seconds, whatever. It'll process those things. Now, and you've got to be really careful with that because let's say you're, you are running cron every five minutes. You can cause a problem for yourself if you set your queue worker time to bump up against that limit. So now you've got these processes that are running here. They haven't finished yet. Your next Drupal cron process tries to run. These things are still running. That's a problem. So be careful with that. It, it really is dependent on how frequently you are running cron. And if you don't put it in, that means that you're running cron through some other mechanism, either a Linux, a Linux cron job, or you're running it manually through some, something else. So again, we extend the queue worker base. That implement, that's what actually implements the interface for you. Um, it's an empty abstract base class. Um, 
you could have your own base class if you want that extends that. It doesn't really matter. And then, of course, we're implementing the container factory plugin interface because this is a plugin. And then we have our one method process item. And then you, your work goes in there. And then, of course, container factory is also for doing dependency injection, right, so that you can actually test this stuff. All right, so the code to populate your queues. There's a couple ways you can do this, and they all look very, very similar. So you might, depending on what you're doing, you might be using a hook entity update, right? So let's say you, this, you've got this entity that updates, and then in the back end, it's got to go do some other stuff or maybe create some other data. This is how you would do that. You, you get an instance of your queue, so you do that through the queue service. Um, you create a new item, it could be an array, it could be an object, it doesn't really matter, it's completely arbitrary, and then you call the create item method and pass that in. Boom, that's how you get an item into the queue. Or maybe you want to do this through a specific entity type so you don't have to put these if statements. So I'm looking for this particular entity type ID, this particular bundle, so on and so forth. You can do it with the more specific hook. Again, it looks the same. Um, sometimes you know, if you're dealing with a custom entity, maybe you want to use the post save method on your custom entity. Again, the code all looks the same. Um, and then the last one, let's say you have a Drush script or some other script that you're doing it. Maybe it's a hook update end to actually put stuff in the queue. Um, this is what you're doing. So you're, you're getting all of the things that you want to in queue. You call your, your, your queue factory to get the, the, the queue that you're going to put these things in, iterate through your entities, stick them in the queue. Pretty simple. You could even do this on, like, on a Drush PHP script, that sort of thing, so you're not tying up your hook entity update. Um, right, and then this is also, this is an example we were talking about how instead of putting one item in the queue that references one entity ID, maybe you want to batch it, right? So maybe you want each queue item to have like 50 things to process, and so on and so forth. Okay. So, clear so far? All right, now comes the fun. We're gonna dive into this. And I'm gonna really, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to do this. Um, I'm a little technologically deficient here. You know what? There is a, um, there is a presenter mode on this, isn't there? On PHP Storm. Yeah. Maybe if I. I swear we're not gonna spend like the rest of this um, uh, presentation with me trying to figure this out. I don't know how to get to presenter mode. All right, forget it, because I don't want to spend the time. All right, so I'm going to tell you what I did for this presentation. And I'm going to pull up a custom site that I built to illustrate what we're talking about here. So the city of Durham Police Department publishes um, all of its data on calls for service that the police department uh, has. So what I did was I imported that data, about half a million records into my database. And what we're looking at here is all the data that, get, gets, uh, that gets exported by their systems. And so here's a, this is a totally con, you know, made up scenario. So you're working for some project like this, you input your data and everything looks great, and then they come back and they're like, well, we see that they've got this X and Y thing in here, but we really want to put on a map where all these calls for service are. And we don't know how to integrate you know, state plane coordinates with Google Maps. So what we're going to need you to do is convert all those to you know, actual latitude and longitude. So great, I've got half a million records in here. I can't do that in an update hook. It's just not going to work, right? And it's, and it's going to take bloody forever. So what did, what did we do here? instead we built a queue so i did i i took the liberty of just putting in an update hook to go ahead and enqueue these things and it's it's really not all that impressive it's exactly what we talked about so we get our our entity storage we get the query to load up all the ids we iterate through the list of ids stick them in the queue and that that took like 20 minutes. Not a great way to do this, but that's the way that I did it. Okay. Um, so now we've got all these things in. We've got all these things in the queue. What does our queue worker look like? So I'm gonna really try to 
figure this out. God, this is terrible. All right, so at the very, very top here, what you will see is it is a Q worker. So we've got our ID here. We're saying it's going to use cron. Um, and actually, for this particular Q worker, I wouldn't use cron because I'm going to show you something really cool how to process these things a lot faster. Um, you'll notice that we're, we're, we're extending a different base class. And I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and then we've got some dependency injection here. So we're going to, for the sake of this example, we're going to pretend that there's some REST API out there where if I call it and give it state plane coordinates, it's going to give me back latitude and longitude. It doesn't actually exist, but for the purposes of this, we're going to pretend it exists. Okay, so all we've got here, we've got our constructor and our static create function so we can do dependency injection. This is really important so that we can do automated testing. Then we've got our get number of queue workers to start. I will talk about that in just a minute. The meat and potatoes is the process item. Okay, so when I enqueued all these things, I put each, each queue item has got an entity ID. So first thing I'm doing, I'm loading up that entity. If I can't load up the entity, I'm going to throw an exception. Then this is a specific exception that, that, is, that we created as part of this, this project that I'm going to talk about. If it's an invalid queue item exception, we can't process it. So don't re, don't re, don't enqueue it again, right? Toss it away. Doesn't matter. We're going to log it. We're going to toss it away. It's not valid. We have an API URL. We're going to try to make a request. We're going to get that data back. We're going to update our entity, save it. And if we can't do all that, there we go. Throw an exception, requeue it, and so on and so forth. Okay, so straightforward. That's our that's our queue worker. So let's talk about how do we test that, right? How do we make sure that this works? Because there's a, there's a couple of if statements in here, right? We want to we want to make sure our code is handling all the different cases. So for this, we've got a unit test, and this unit test is going to set up a ton of mocks so that we can actually go and make sure that what we wrote is working in all cases. So we're going to set up a mock of the entity type manager. So the way I set the way I set up my unit tests is I look at the constructor of the class that I am trying to um, test, and I create mocks for all the dependencies. So in our particular uh, class, we have an entity type manager. We've got a guzzle client. We've got a logger. And we know that we're using the, uh, the storage, the entity storage interface, to load these things. So we've got to mock that as well. The most important things, though, are really making sure that this this stuff all works. So we we want to make sure that when we say we're going to log something, we actually do. So I've got a mock logger here, and I can actually make assertions to say that, yeah, this logger actually did log an error, or no errors were logged at all. Um, so number of queue workers to start, that's a, again, I'll talk about that in just a minute. I know I keep pushing that off, but okay, so when a process is invalid, we talked about that. We tried to load an entity, it didn't exist, it was invalid, we need to handle that, that case. So when the entity storage interface is called and it loads with a specific value, we're going to return null. That is simulating that you tried to load an entity and it didn't give you, it didn't give you back anything, right? Um, and then here's our logger, logger stuff. So we want to say that we expect that when this method is called and there's, a, there's an invalid entity, we expect an exception to be thrown, and this is what that, exp that exception looks like. We also expect that exception to be of a specific class, and then we call our, then we call our method. So that's how you test that particular thing. The guzzle stuff is more interesting, right? Because with guzzle, you can say down here, that when you make a request to Guzzle, it's going to throw a request exception, you know, bad request. So now we can test that. We, we set up our, our, our Guzzle mock here to throw an exception. So now we can test that our code actually caught that exception and did what we expect. So you've got your, your loggers down there. We expect our logger should be called one time. It should have um, a specific message and so on and so forth. Um, and at the very end, we expect our method to throw an exception. So. The hardest part of this is figuring out how to, to write the mocks. 
The rest of it is really following the code that you wrote. Did I, did the method and, and the contents of that method and what it's doing actually fit what I'm expecting? The last case here is that we got a, we got a success. So we set up Guzzle so that it, um, it actually will return some fake data, right? And a 200 uh, response code. We set, up our, we set up some mocks of the entity stuff so that we don't actually have to run this with a database. I mean, we could have done this with a kernel test and then it would have actually created an entity, but you can, if you can do it with a unit test, do it with a unit test. It's a lot faster, uh, especially to run, right? Um, so anyway, that, that's that stuff. Now, what, now you're gonna say, well, what about the other stuff where we need to make sure that stuff actually gets into the queue? So for that, we're gonna talk about this module that my coworker and I wrote, it's called Parallel Queues. Now what the Parallel Queue system does is it uses the Symphony Process plugin, which creates sub-processes um, in, a, in a safe way that doesn't fork bomb your server. So what we did here, we said, well, okay, we want, our, we want Prawn to run every minute. And in that minute, we want to have a certain number of prone workers run depending on the size of the queue. So if it's a small number of items in the queue, we may only want one worker to be running. But if that queue expands really big, we want that to scale out up to any number of, of queue workers. Right? So this is a very flexible uh, system. It's, it's called Parallel Queues Module. Uh, I believe we're going to be releasing this on Drupal.org. There is already a module called Parallel Queue. I don't like the way it works. It uses some React engine in the back um, as, a, as a daemon. Don't like it. This is a pure PHP solution. Doesn't have any, over, any, any overhead of weird dependencies and system type stuff. Um, so what does, the, what does this thing actually do? Let's look at the parallel queue module. So we talked about how there's an invalid queue exception. There's some drush commands for actually running the, the parallel queues. Um, what you're going to actually do is you're going to call run parallel and it's going to find all of the parallel queues that, that follow this interface. So we, we set up here in our calls for service parallel queue worker that this particular queue worker implements a different interface. And that interface is the parallel queue worker base or the parallel queue worker. Um, and it has a method that adds to the interface for determining how uh, many queue workers should run. So this method here, if our queue is empty, we're only gonna start up one worker, which isn't gonna do anything. Otherwise, we're gonna do, uh, we're gonna do some math to figure out exactly how this thing should scale up depending on the number of workers. And then catching any exceptions and, and, and so on. So the magic of all this stuff is actually in the main class, the queue helper. And what the queue helper does is it, when you look at the run parallel, it, it then goes and creates the processes, right? For each of the, these parallel queues that it knows about. And what the create process does, this is where it uses that symphony process stuff. It goes and creates, it looks to see if our queue worker is, is an instance of our parallel queue worker figures out how many of these workers it should start, defines a command, in this case, it's, it's our custom drush command to run a specific queue, sets up some uh, verbose output if you pass that into your drush command, and then it calls new process. Now, new process, this is the symphony process thing that does a sub loop, a sub process. Um, and sets some timeouts and, and whatnot, and then it starts. And the way this thing kind of works, it works with an anonymous callback function, right? So as each process starts, it ends up going and calling this stuff. And so on and so forth. So the outcome of this, uh, and I really need to pull that back up because I minimized it and I shouldn't have. It's not the right one. This is the one I want. When we were actually run this, what you can see here is there are five five queue processes that actually ran. Because I've got you know half a million items in my queue, it actually spun them up and because it's not a real API, it's not doing any work. I do this for demonstration purposes, but you can see they each have their own PID, 
and there are five of them. Now, if I only had like 10 items in the queue, I would have only had one process. So this is, this is one technique for actually scaling this. And um, like I said, there's, a, there's some other solutions out there. I've seen it done with, with, uh, with React stuff. I've seen it done with the process control forks. Don't do that unless you, know, you are not actually in a web environment. If you're not in a web environment, fine, have at it. But I think because we're in Drupal, we're all in a web environment, don't do it. Um, I've also seen it where you can kind of pump this stuff out to like a rabbit MQ, um, you know, other system, right? Or even Redis queues or some, something like that. Um, right, so back to the code, how do we test this? Uh, for this thing, we've got a, a kernel test, and we've got a trade. I don't want the trade. I want the, I want the kernel test. Right. So, what we're doing really here, when you are testing your your queue processing stuff, you can create items. You can assert the number of items in the queue. You can process things by setting up uh, mocks. You can check your logs to make sure that you're actually getting uh, logged what you expect. And that's what all this, all this stuff is doing here. We're setting up, we're, we're figuring out you know, when exceptions happen. We're setting up cases where you know, if the queue system says it's got 25 in it, how many queue workers should I actually expect? And so on and so forth. So, not only can we scale our queue workers, but we can write tests on them. Does that make sense? If you're not writing automated tests, why aren't you writing automated tests? Because no one knows how. No one knows how? Okay. I, um, in 2019, I did a presentation here on how to do, how to actually write kernel tests, unit tests, functional tests. Look it up on the Drupal Camp Asheville. Uh, it's probably on YouTube someplace. Look it up. Um, I hope it helps. Uh, you should be writing automated tests. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, I'm really passionate about that. So um, back to our back to our presentation. And I'm just going to do this again. Some other modules to investigate. So there is advanced queue. Queue UI is really important. That's a nice extension. It actually gives you an admin page that tells you how many items are in the queues, what queues are there. Um, it, it, that's a really good one. Queue mail is really cool. It, you know, if you've got a site where you're sending out lots of email, Queue mail will, will actually use the underlying queue system to actually send that stuff out. So if you're sending out like thousands and thousands of, of, of mail, uh, mail messages, queues are the way to go. Um, and that's actually the impetus for writing the parallel queue stuff. Our system sends out thousands and thousands and thousands of messages. And in, in our, our legacy uh, Drupal platform, it does it one by one by one by one. And we have tons of problems with scalability. So we wrote this. It scales out. I think we're running you know, 10 queue workers on, on busy times. And it, go, it cuts through the list like butter. It, it's pretty awesome. Um, Q unique we talked about that's a really important one where you need to do updates on an entity and you want to you want to make sure that it doesn't get queued multiple times you know or or any any, any kind of data where you don't want it to get processed uh, many times um, I used to do a lot of work with RabbitMQ like if you don't want Drupal system to to do this um, let's say you want to you know you want to outsource that work off your main servers onto some other hosted thing there used to be a Drupal 7 module. Um, it was pretty much abandoned. This guy kind of picked it up and uh, forked it. So that's an important one. You can get it on GitHub. I haven't tested it out, but it, it was pretty solid. Um, RabbitMQ is pretty awesome. And then you can do what I talked about there. You know, that uses like SupervisorD or SystemD to run your queues, your queue workers as daemons. Right, so they're always working. They never shut down. Instead of wait, waiting on cron to run on a one-minute schedule or a five or twenty-minute, your queue workers are just always running. You know, give me something to do. On very busy systems, that's a great way to go. All right, I know we cut through this really quickly, but I figure you guys are going to have questions, and I figure you're going to want lunch. Um, what questions do you have? <laughs> 
do you feel like you could write a queue worker? Okay. The queue worker again. So I'm going to talk. Uh, I'll show. I'll just show this code again. Um, I did one that's parallel. Here's one. Here's one that's not parallel. The queue worker always starts with an annotation. Okay. To identify what the name of the queue is. And then it's literally just one method, process item, and that's where you do your work. Super simple. If you're working in Drupal 7, Drupal 7 has a queue system that works very similar to this. The code is going to look different, but it uses a series of hooks, right? But you can do this in Drupal 7 if you're still in Drupal 7, but if you're on 8, 9, 10, uh, this is what your code is going to look like. The matching system works with queues, right? It does. It, the, the batching system uses what's called a memory queue. So instead of putting it in the database, it sticks it in memory, you know, a big array, and then chunks through that. And I don't know, maybe I'm the only one, but batch processes fail for me all the time, especially with search API when you've got, you know, you know we our, our platform um, indexes to Elasticsearch. And, you know, we've got, you know, uh, 600,000 entities that we're indexing, and you try to use that in memory thing, it just dies. It just dies, and you end up having to do it over and over and over again. Your mileage will vary, but yes, it does use memory queue in the background. The only thing I, love, I got a little unsure of, you only need to implement a queue worker? Correct. As long as you're, you know, because you can call that, you, you can make up any queue name on the fly you want. Up yes. So you only really need him to that's that's correct. Now, you can also do clever little things. So, like for example, our mail system, we have some config entities to denote priority. So you might have a business hours priority where you want messages to or you want work to happen during business hours. Maybe you want one to be like it's a high priority, so it's any day of the week, any time. Maybe you want it one to work only on the weekends. You can use the derivative system because these are plugins. You can use derivatives to actually generate your queue workers on the fly, which is pretty cool based off of some other configuration. So it's really flexible. When you talk about arbitrary ID, it's, it's, it's very, very flexible that way. So literally, that's all you need to do, and then you just need to put your items in the queue. Um, does what you just showed today on that be integrated with the queue UI system you're talking about? Absolutely. Add more stuff? Just nope. as is? Plug and play. Yep. Um, and there, there are other types of queue, like the, the delayed queue stuff that, that works. Queue unique works the same way. Um, there are other, I, I've seen other types of queue process. I don't know if you guys know this, but in, in, in Drupal, you can replace certain services. So there's a queue factory service, which is actually what runs all, all these things. You can actually swap out that service with your own service to do highly specialized things. I don't like to do that unless it's really necessary. So, like I've done that with some of the some of the entity access stuff. Um, I wouldn't recommend it. So, be careful when you're looking at some of these modules. Look at what they're doing. If they're swapping out services, that should be kind of like a red flag. You don't have to do that. Anything else? Thank you so much for coming. Appreciate it.